So I'm going to China. Not only once, but twice this year. Well, I guess twice this Chinese year, because I'm going once in September, and then I'm going once again for Chinese New Year. So twice this lunar year. I'm going because I've been with my incredible girlfriend, Dorothy, for almost four years, and I've never met the family she has over there. I'd also like to see what Beijing and Shanghai look like during Chinese New Year, and I've never been to China, so it's time to travel. However, to give you a little peek behind the curtain, whenever I go somewhere for a couple of weeks, I film as many videos as I can, so while I'm gone, the pages are still posting. Now, I do this for two reasons, for me and for you. The reason I do it for you is because I understand that my content means a lot to a lot of people out there, and therefore I want to be as ever-present in all of my fans' lives as I am when I'm home. But the second, and probably stronger reason if we're being real here, is that I'm terrified of losing my career as a YouTuber, and I believe that if I go one week, two weeks, or maybe even three weeks without posting on YouTube that when I come back, all of my views and all of my viewers will be gone. Now, is that reality? Probably not, but I'm not going to test the theory. Now, researching, writing a script, and filming one YouTube video in a day is taxing, but doable, incredibly doable. Doing two YouTube videos in a day, a bit more difficult, especially when you're trying to manage a somewhat good work-life balance and you also have a whole podcast you have to run. And because it's whenever there's the prospect of a vacation on the horizon, I not only have to manage my six uploads a week schedule, but also double that down so that while I'm gone for those two or three weeks, we're still doing six uploads a day, which is doable. I do it all the time, but it can lead to a fair amount of burnout. And thus, today's video is gonna be a little different. Not different in the capacity that we're not gonna be talking about Naruto, we very much are, but different in the capacity that I don't have to write a two hour script for this video. See, for a long time, pretty much as long as I've had an email, my inbox has been flooded with questions from you, the fans, who treat me as a weird amalgamation of Google and a help kiosk at an airport. I get about 50 to 70 emails a day, depending on the day, and while most of them are questions that could very much be answered with a quick Google, some of them pose legitimately interesting questions that I may actually be the only person qualified to answer. But I do also get a lot of common questions revolving around events or themes in Naruto that are a bit confusing. And while these questions could be answered with a quick Google search, they are relatively good questions. They're not things like, why they cut Naruto's hair like that? And thus, about once a month, I would like to sit down and talk to you kind of through the medium of a screen and answer the questions that you guys send to me because there's really nothing in it for me to shoot you guys emails back 50 times a day answering questions that you could google but there's definitely something in it for me to answer it in the form of what I get paid to do. And thus, this is the advent of Hammer Time Q&A. And we have a lot of really good questions in here actually. This first batch that I've gathered together is kind of awesome. Interesting what ifs, pressing questions about confusing plot lines in Naruto, and more than anything, personal questions about me and how Naruto has affected me in my lifetime. So while this may not be your average info dumpy episode where I tell you all about one topic, or a ranking video where I rank all of the Hokage based on how thick that dumpy is, there will be a good amount of Naruto information, if not our standard amount of Naruto information conveyed during this video. And you might learn a little thing about me. Cool. We got it, we understand the premise, we understand why I'm doing it, awesome. Let's get into it. But before we get into anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And I'm considering doing Q and A's for non-Naruto questions on my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where I talk about anything but Naruto and Boruto. And considering the fact that I only upload twice a week on that page, I figured that I would be able to make this an additional upload for Weeb Commander once a month, bumping our grand total up to nine uploads on Weeb Commander a month. Because you know who needs more work? This guy. And if you're interested in interacting with all of my work, then you should be following my anime podcast, Utaku's Anonymous, that I do every week with Danny Mata, where me and him break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. But before we get into all that, guys, today we got to talk about a brand new sponsor to the page, Sundays for Dogs. See, as we all know, I have a couple of dogs that like to be in a lot of my videos. Well, one of them likes to be in my videos. The other likes to sleep. And Sundays for Dogs is actually very important to me because it allows me to give my dogs their best possible life. See, Sundays is a dog food company founded by a veterinarian that offers fresh, air-dried, human-grade food for your dogs. But the concept of feeding your dogs human-grade food can be a little bit intimidating, but it doesn't have to be because Sunday for Dogs is not only incredibly easy to store, but also incredibly easy to serve. See, most food dog brands are either healthy or easy, but Sundays for Dogs 
is both. See, Sundays is human grade food from start to finish, with not only a list of ingredients that you can read and pronounce, but also could eat yourself if you wanted to. You know what? It actually wasn't that bad. See, each recipe starts off with whole protein, whether it be all natural turkey, beef, chicken, and is followed by mineral rich organs and ground bone, all things that your dog would be eating in the wild. And 10% of the recipe is made up with superfoods that improve your dog's health. Now, Sundays is air dried, which makes it look like a soft jerky and Trust me, it chews like a soft jerky. And because it's air dried, it preserves its nutrition and flavor. Unlike most kibble, which loses a lot of its nutrition through the high temperature cooking it goes through. But with this dog food looking different than kibble, is it inconvenient? No, it's shelf stable and travel ready. And it allows you to allow your dogs to have a high level of nutrition and taste anywhere at any time. And every order ships directly to your door. So you never have to worry about running out of dog food again. Not to mention, if you use their subscribe and save feature, you'll save 20% on all future offers. Listen, my two boys had hot girl stomach issues. Kibble just didn't agree with them. However, after switching to Sundays, their coats have become shinier. They've gotten more energy and the hot girl tummy issues are gone. So why is air dried meat first ingredient food important for your dogs? Well, our dogs are our best friends. And do you think Naruto would give Sasuke anything but the best? So strive to be like Naruto and switch to Sundays today. Get 35% off your order of Sundays today by either using the link in my description or entering the code on screen at checkout. Give your dogs the food they deserve. So before we actually jump into your actual questions, I know I opened this video saying that I get a lot of emails, but I'd like to get less emails because the problem is with you guys emailing my business email is that that's also where my business takes place. So we actually created a Reddit, a place where our entire community can hang out to ask me questions that can get used for videos like this, post some of their favorite Naruto slash Boruto memes, or simply just talk about what's going on in Boruto or their favorite moments in Naruto. Basically, we created a space where people can talk about all things Naruto and Boruto while also asking me questions for possible Q&A videos. Because once again, my business happens in the business email. And parsing through a dozen questions of why didn't Itachi and Shisui kiss before Itachi pushed him into the waterfall as I'm trying to get to brand deals, I, it makes me miss a lot of things. So please direct any and all questions as far away from my email as possible and place them on the Reddit, which is on screen now. Now that all the rules and the explanations are out of the way, let's actually dive into some of these questions. And our first question is kind of a simple one. A person by the name of AA, I'm gonna block out people's emails, said, hello. If Naruto and Hashirama are both reincarnations of Ashura, how could both of their souls be in the world at the same time, unless only the body is the reincarnation and not the soul? Which is a good question. However, it really has nothing to do with the body, and it has more to do with the soul, but not the soul of either Naruto or Hashirama or any of Ashura's reincarnations. So you've actually seen physical drawings of how Ashura and Indra reincarnate amongst their reincarnations. See, the way that the reincarnation cycle works is surprisingly simple simple. Once the reincarnations of both Indra and Ashura have both passed away, and that's important, Indra and Ashura's soul then go and find different reincarnations. And it's not like Indra and Ashura live inside of these reincarnations. They kind of clasp onto them from behind. That is to say that their soul becomes connected to their reincarnation, but never takes over their own soul. Indra and Ashura reincarnations have their own soul, which is why being a reincarnation of Indra and Ashura leads to massive boosts. Because outside of your own soul in your own chakra, you also have the boost associated with being connected to Indra or Ashura. However, let's say hypothetically you are an Indra or an Ashura reincarnation. Madara and Hashirama are really good examples of this. Madara technically stalled the Indra and Ashura Hashira reincarnation cycle by keeping himself alive way longer than he should have been. So after Hashirama dies prior to the first Great Shinobi World War, there is no Ashura reincarnation on Earth. Unless technically you subscribe to the theory that Ashura moved from Hashirama to Minato and then latter to Naruto. But that's a theory at best. However, since Madara prolonged his life, there wasn't a new cycle of Indra and Ashura reincarnations until Madara unplugged himself from the ghetto statue. Which is why Naruto and Sasuke, who were born somewhere around the time of Madara's death, became the reincarnation 
reincarnations of Indra and Ashra. But if we think about being an Indra and Ashra reincarnation in the way that we just described, it's not like Indra or Ashra lives in both Naruto and Hashirama. It's just that Indra or Ashra's soul has now moved from somebody who's dead to a new alive person. And since Ashra's soul can only be one place, since Naruto and Hashirama are both existing at the same time, his soul is with Naruto, the alive reincarnation. Now, this is actually technically really important for plot reasons, because a lot of people have speculated that Sasuke could awaken a new Rinnegan so long as he got an arm made out of Hashirama's cells, because Madara was able to awaken a Rinnegan by taking Hashirama's cells. And while, in theory, that sounds as though it would work, unfortunately, that's not the way that it works. See, Hashirama is no longer, after his death, Ashura's reincarnation. And thus, if you were to take Hashirama's cells and graft them to you as Indra's reincarnation, like Sasuke would to awaken another Rinnegan hypothetically, all that Sasuke would get would be Hashirama's sage mode, an insane healing factor, and a new arm, which would be a massive boost, but he wouldn't be mixing Ashura and Indra's chakra together. Now, if he were to hypothetically take Naruto's DNA and inject it into himself, then yes, he could possibly awaken Rinnegan, as that would be the combination of Ashura and Indra's chakra. And since Hashirama is no longer Ashura's reincarnation, there is no point so far as trying to combine Indra and Ashura's chakra to taking his DNA. But speaking of Hashirama, our second question is also about Hashirama. This question is from Yadhu, and it reads, Rochimaru and the Warak said that Hashirama can undo the reanimation binding anytime he want, then didn't in the Konoha Crush arc. Now, I understand that is because of the fact that Kishimoto probably didn't thought of making Hashirama that OP, but is there any in-universe explanation of that? A big part of reading emails is parsing through a lot of grammatical errors, but also a lot of the people who email me have English as a second language, so I can't hold it against them. Now, this is a very commonly asked question. So yes, when Orochimaru brings the four Kage back during the war arc, he states that Hashirama would be able to break out of Edo Tensei whenever he wants, which led a lot of people to the question, if Hashirama could break out during the war arc, why didn't he break out during the Konoha crush arc? Did Hashirama want to destroy Konoha? No, he didn't. There's actually a pretty simple explanation to it. And though it's not one that's like super hyper confirmed, it's all but confirmed. See, pretty much directly after Orochimaru says that Hashirama could break out whenever he wants, Tobirama talks about how Edo Tensei will probably be Orochimaru's undoing. And the reason that Tobirama talks about that is because he's telling Orochimaru that the better he gets with Edo Tensei, that is to say that the stronger he is able to bring people back to life, the more risk that's associated with bringing those people back. See, what essentially what Tobirama is saying here is that the closer that the people that Orochimaru brings back to life are to their original strength, that is, while they were alive, the more risk posed to Orochimaru. Because the stronger the person brought back, the harder they are to control with Edo Tensei. Especially in the capacity that Orochimaru likes to control people with Edo Tensei. Because Orochimaru and Kabuto have very different approaches to Edo Tensei. Kabuto likes to bring as many people possible back to life and give them a vague directive. Like he'll bring back people like Gengetsu Hozuki and be like, destroy the Shinobi Alliance. But he won't control Gengetsu Hozuki's personality, or what he says, or even how he fights. And thus, even though Gengetsu's Edo Tensei body will do all that it can to destroy the Shinobi Alliance, Gengetsu can yell at the people around him about the weaknesses of his Genjutsu-inducing clan. Now, people with particularly strong wills are able to break out of Kabuto's Edo Tensei. The best example of this is Hanzo the Salamander, who's able to break out of Kabuto's Edo Tensei to a certain degree and cut the poison sack in his stomach, causing him to be stunned long enough for Mifune to cut him down and seal him. And thus, Hanzo kind of corroborates exactly what we're talking about here, that the stronger the people you bring back, the higher level of chance that they break out of your Edo Tensei. And thus, Tobirama was saying this specifically when he said it, the second time he came around through the version of Edo Tensei, shows that Orochimaru has all but mastered Edo Tensei and is therefore able to bring people back at their peak is strength, at least as strong as they were when they died. And thus the prevailing theory on why didn't Hashirama break out of Edo Tensei the first time is because Orochimaru's grasp over Edo Tensei when he was battling against Hiruzen was so loose that Hashirama wasn't strong enough to be able to break out of it, and there wasn't enough of his personality intact to even realize what was going on, as Hashirama doesn't even recognize Orochimaru the second time he's been reincarnated, which lead a lot of people to believe that Tobirama and Hashirama were just hollow shells of what they used to be when they were reincarnated in their battle against Hiruzen. Which makes sense when you consider the fact that Hiruzen was able to seal all three of them with Reaper Death Seal. And even though Hiruzen is a ninja of legendary renown, Hashirama probably has the second most chakra out of anybody in the universe who's not Notsutsuki. And the idea that Hiruzen would have enough chakra to pull his soul out and Tobirama's soul out and half of Orochimaru's soul out 
is kind of crazy, but not as crazy as making 1010 relevant to the story, which is the subject of our third question. Logan emailed me a ton of questions, and we're not going to answer all of them, but we're going to answer the ones that I like. Logan emailed me, hey Nick, your content is amazing, and it brought back the love I had for Naruto. My random question for you is about the video you made on how you would fix Konoha's team. Basically, what if teams were actually built like this? For those of you who don't know, I made an entire video titled How I Would Fix the Konoha 13, where I changed up all of the Konoha 13 teams to make every single one of the teams relevant. The two questions from the slew of questions that I want to answer from Logan are, how would I make 1010 relevant to the story, and how much more powerful would Sakura be if she was taught by Kuranai? So let's answer the first question first. How would I make 1010 relevant to the story of Naruto? Well, I think there's actually a case study in the way to make side characters relevant to your story, and that case study is Black Clover. Black Clover, I believe, does the whole ensemble anime thing better than any other anime in history. Every single character in Black Clover who even exists in the story from periphery, we know the motivations of, the powers of, we see them get their own individual fights. So far as telling the story of side characters, Black Clover is perfect. And thus, I would take a page out of Black Clover's book for 1010 and all of the side characters in the Kotoha 13. But how I would specifically make 1010 relevant to the story of Naruto is that I'd send her on a little journey. See, we know that 1010 is capable of using any weapon she lays her hands on. We've seen her pick up sacred tools of the Sage of Six Paths, weapons that were only ever used by Hagoromo or Ginkaku and Kinkaku, and learn how to use them immediately. And there are a lot of very powerful weapons in Naruto. And thus, if I wanted to make 1010 relevant to the story, I would send her on an arc where she went to go collect powerful weapons. See, because for the entirety of 1010's run as a character, the only weapons that she really uses are kunai and shuriken and sickles with an occasional chain thrown in there. All incredibly basic kenjutsu weapons that every ninja can use. However, if 1010 has a level of proficiency to allow her to pick up whatever weapon she wants and use it at the highest level possible, so long as her chakra allows her, why wouldn't we send 1010 on maybe a two episode, three episode mission to try to collect as many weapons as possible to remain relevant in the massively evolving landscape that is being a ninja leading into the fourth great shinobi world war. And thus I would have 1010 clash with people like Suigetsu Hozuki, other weapons collector, as she was trying to collect things like the seven swords of the mist. I would have her venturing to the cloud to find the rest of the sacred tools of the Sage of Six Paths. It was confirmed to Kakashi Retsudon, the first of the Retsudon trio, that there is a tool in the land of... Donnie? I don't remember what the land was called. There's a small country that used to be a desert, and they got no water whatsoever. Radaku, that's what it is. But in order to make sure this land would always have water, Hagoromo created a tool. A tool that he taught the royal family of Radaku how to use, that allowed them to create infinite water. And thus, it's complete canon knowledge that Hagoromo, in his journey around the Earth, created incredible ninja tools that 1010 could collect in order to boost her strength. And now, I'm not saying she go on a villain arc and steal an infinite water source from a desert country, but if Hagoromo is creating legendary legendary ninja tools and handing them out to the people around the world, 1010 could get her hands on a couple, and thus she could fall into a categorization of somewhere around Suigetsu or Chojuro, or even Darui, legendary Kenjutsu users who were able to bang with the best of them because of the weapons they wield. Now on to the Sakura question. How powerful would Sakura be if she was trained by Kuranai? Well, this is also a good question, because for all intents and purposes, Sakura should have been trained by Kuranai. See, Kakashi identified that Sakura had an insane level of chakra control from the jump, and you need chakra control for two things in the Naruto world. Well, you kind of need it for everything, but two things specifically. The first, is medical ninjutsu, and the second is genjutsu. You need chakra control for medical ninjutsu for the same reason that you can't have a shaky hand as a surgeon. Healing people's either exterior or interior wounds with your chakra requires an incredibly gentle touch. For genjutsu, you need chakra control for a slightly different reason. See, in order to be a practice genjutsu user, you have to be able to augment somebody's five senses by controlling their chakra network, which means your level of chakra control has to be higher than the person you're trying to place under genjutsu, which is why Kur and I got tossed in a blender when she tried to put Itachi under Genjutsu because Itachi's chakra control was actually better than hers. Now, obviously, Sakura found a way to be incredibly powerful by using her chakra control to be incredible at medical ninjutsu. But what if, hypothetically, Sakura was trained by Kurenai to be a Genjutsu specialist? Well, considering the fact the level of medical ninjutsu specialization that Sakura has been able to achieve, probably becoming the greatest medical ninjutsu user on Earth outside of Tsunade, and she might actually be better than her. We don't know. They've never done, like, a medicine 
it off. So far as chakra control goes, Sakura is probably the best in the world. And this is corroborated by a bunch of her feats. Like in Sakura Hiden, when she was able to apply chakra to her hands in order to catch a fireball. Or in Sasuke Retsudan, when she was able to funnel chakra into an entire underground bunker and figure out all of the rooms, traps, and people in said bunker. Or in the last, when it was revealed to us that Sakura is basically immune to Genjutsu, and therefore she was the only reason that Naruto was able to get to the moon and back. And thus, if hypothetically Sakura were to lean into being the Genjutsu specialist, there's no reason for us to believe that she wouldn't be the greatest Genjutsu user on Earth. But unfortunately, we don't really know what that would mean. See, Kurenai was said to be the greatest Genjutsu specialist in Konoha. And considering the fact that Konoha is the strongest village in the entirety of the Naruto world, that means Kurenai is at least top three in Genjutsu, and yet her Genjutsu wasn't enough to overcome the Genjutsu of Itachi. And thus, one can make the argument that even the greatest Genjutsu specialist who doesn't have an ocular dojutsu would be foiled by somebody with said dojutsu. And sure, while the Uchiha are now gone, they're not the only people with ocular-based dojutsu, as there's also the Shinoiki clan, who wield the Katsurigan. Now, there's only one of those left as well, but the question remains, would Sakura be able to overcome ocular dojutsu genjutsu? To which we can't really say. However, so far as my headcanon goes, I believe that Sakura would train with Kurenai until she all but mastered genjutsu, and then she would go to train with Tsunade. Because, once again, in this alternate universe, Sakura is never never with Kakashi, which means she gets a couple of years with Kurenai before the time skip. Well, maybe not a couple of years, but a goodish amount of time. And in that time, Kurenai could teach Sakura a whole lot about Genjutsu, and thus Sakura would have a base to build on. And then after Sakura had a base of Genjutsu, she could go to learn with Tsunade and learn all of the medical ninjutsu she currently knows, which means we would get the basic Sakura that we already have, plus Genjutsu mastery. Now, Sakura actually does have a Genjutsu ability. She's able to, when she places her hands on somebody, funnel Sakura petals onto them that places them into a trance-like Genjutsu. We also learned this in Sasuke Ratsudan. So the only way I really know how to answer the question of how powerful would Sakura be if she trained with Kurenai is that maybe add Kurenai to current existing Sakura and that's what you would get. Because quite honestly, even though she never trained with Kurenai, she did kind of figure out Genjutsu. She's able to use it, she's all but resistant to it, so all because of her incredible mastery over chakra control, it's kind of like she did train with Kurenai. But she probably wouldn't have been disrespected by Sasuke when he placed her under a Genjutsu that made her believe she was killed by him. But then again, she might have been when you consider the fact that that was launched with a Rinnegan. And with Kurenai as her teacher, she probably wouldn't have learned how to overcome ocular dojutsu, because what's Kurenai gonna teach her about in that regard? Fourth question, Andre asks, Hello, Nick. First of all, I really appreciate your content. Thank you, Andre. Hope to watch your content as much as possible, and I hope you do as well. Secondly, I was re-watching Naruto and wondered, why does Obito, while being Toby, fools around like that when taking Sasori's place? I tried to figure out what he can achieve by doing this, but cannot understand the reasoning. From a broken heart full of revenge, emo to goofing like that for no reason found it quite strange now this is a good question without a concrete answer because you're not asking how hard obito punchy and i like these kinds of questions questions that make you speculate about the characteristics and personalities of characters and honestly it is a good question why is toby so goofy what was obito going for by making toby such a joyous overzealous character it's completely out of line with everything that we know about Obito. And really, as I see it, there's two possibilities. One is that Toby was kind of a smokescreen. See, pretty much the worst thing for Obito would have been if people figured out that Toby was Obito. I mean, it was relatively obvious. He wore a mask with one hole in it that had a Sharingan. How many other people have one Sharingan? But it was just obvious to us viewers, not to people within the Naruto universe. And thus, in order to keep people off the trail of connecting Toby to Obito, Toby tried to create an entirely new personality. One that took nothing seriously, that approached life with a smile, but was still very powerful. But doing that would be kind of weird, because not that many people knew Obito. I mean, everybody that grew up in Kakashi's generation with Obito knew Obito, but it's not like Obito was overly dreary and emo before he died. I mean, sure, he got moody about Kakashi and how Rin had a crush on Kakashi, but he wasn't nearly as emo or distraught as he was in the war arc. So why was Toby such a silly character? Well, I believe that the answer is actually much more complex than a smokescreen. In order to understand Toby, we have to understand Obito. And actually more than that, we have to understand the connection between the two. See, when Obito was Toby, he didn't have to be Obito. Think of it a bit like cosplay. The reason that so many people who do cosplay love doing cosplay is because for a day, they don't have to be Nick. They can be Natsu Dragneel. I can talk to people in a silly voice. I can do an impression. I can pretend for a second that I'm in one of my favorite universes. And I believe, honestly, 
Obito was going through something very similar. Let's remember for a moment the moment that broke Obito, Rin's death. Madara sets up a situation where Rin has Isobu implanted into her, and then Rin forces Kakashi to kill her, all of which Obito sees. However, after Obito is done mopping up pretty much the entirety of the Hidden Mist's Ombu Force, he says something rather interesting, and that rather interesting thing is, I'm in hell. Obito does not like being Obito after that moment, because everything connected to Obito is either dead or dying, or he wishes was already gone. And thus, when Obito isn't Obito and he's Toby, he gets to be an entirely different person. The child he was never allowed to be, the childhood that was robbed from him. See, Obito, before he even died, didn't have much of a childhood. We know nothing about Obito's upbringing, we know nothing about Obito's parents, but at the very least, Obito was raised in Konoha as it was ramping up for the Third Great Shinobi World War, which means Obito probably lived through the Second Great Shinobi World War, and Obito's entire childhood was dedicated to becoming a child soldier, which all builds up to the climax of Obito going on one of the most important missions in the entire Third Great Shinobi World War, kind of succeeding, but also dying before he even gets to grow up. Then in actuality, he doesn't die. He spends a year with an old man tapped into a very scary statue. Eventually, that old man sends him to go see his friends, but at that moment, his friend is killing his love. So far as being a child, Obito has never had an opportunity to live out any of the childhood things that any child should get to do. And thus, when Obito dons the mask, he gets to see the world in this jovial nature that he never got to see the world in before. And now that Obito had the power and the ability to not be pressed or taken down by pretty much anybody on Earth, he could view any situation with a level of unseriousness that only the truly powerful can view the world with. And thus, Toby is goofy for the same reason that people in cosplay use goofy voices, to try to hold on to that inner child that exists within all of us. But society actively tries to, you know, kill. Which leads us to our last question, sent in by... Eric? R I A R Y K. Is that is that Eric? R Auric? I'm going with Auric. Swear to God, if someone is like, it's actually R E K, I'm I'm ending it all. The name sent in. Hey there, Nick. I'm a big fan of yours and I love your videos. Thank you. And your journey through One Piece has been great to watch because personally, I caught up reading the manga. Congratulations. Couldn't be me. I have a question though. For as far as you've gotten, what's your favorite lesson from any arc you've witnessed? Because for me, even though it hurts to think about the lesson taught to Luffy after Marine Ford on how he was not ready for the new world, but I was just curious, what's your favorite lesson? Now, technically, this is an email about One Piece, and therefore, it'd probably be better for my other channel, The Weeb Commander, which statistically, the majority of you haven't followed yet. Much in the same capacity that the Straw Hat crew would steal something for their own, I'm going to steal this question for this page, and apply the question of what's the favorite lesson that you've learned from a certain arc of One Piece to Naruto. It's unfortunate because Aryuk knows me from my One Piece shorts on The Weeb Commander, so you probably won't see this video. Which, with a name like that, is probably a good thing because I'm for sure wrong. So, for today's video, Eric asked the question, what's the favorite lesson that you've learned from a particular arc in Naruto? And while I do believe that this question is actually better suited for other anime, like One Piece or Hunter x Hunter, Naruto has taught me some incredibly important things. Now, obviously, there's the core tenets of Naruto that run throughout the entire show. The hard work, dedication, and the love of your friends can get you through any kind of rough patch. And obviously, this is put on display by Naruto every Every single episode. He shows that regardless of the circumstance of your birth, that you can achieve whatever you set your mind to so long as you never waver. And sometimes even though other people, or even yourself, which is symbolized through Kurama in Naruto, will try to shake you from this path, so long as you walk this path unwaveringly, you will achieve what you want. And I kind of live my life by that, but that's not what I want to talk about. Non-ironically, you know what Naruto taught me? Smile. It sounds like a simple message. It sounds like something that anybody out there could teach you. It sounds like something that a creepy old man passing an attractive woman on the street would say. But I think sometimes we dive so deeply into the meaning of things that we actually miss what they're truly about. See, all throughout Naruto, while there is very much a vein of working hard and dedicating yourself to a certain craft until you master it, the thing that resonates the most in Naruto to me is Naruto and other people like Naruto's ability to be magnetic to the people around them. See, there are three people throughout Naruto history who have incredible magnetism, and those three people are either Ashura or Ashura reincarnations. And all three of these people are described as rays of sunlight, people who light up a room when they walk into it, people who improve the lives of people they touch true born leaders who acquired that leadership trait 
by caring about the people around them. See, Ashura is able to go out into the world and gather people around him because Ashura helps the people around him. He understands their situation. He practices empathy. And because this becomes a natural leader that people are drawn to, which is why Hagoromo chooses him to impart his will after his death. And the beauty of Ashura's situation to me is that he's born weaker than his brother, Indra. However, Ashura makes up for his own weakness with kindness and finds true strength, undeniable, unshakable strength in his ability to gather people to his cause. And this lesson is taught over and over and over again in Naruto. As Sasuke, an incredibly talented ninja from the second he was born, begins to isolate himself more and more, technically, he only gets weaker. Sure, his ninjutsu and his genjutsu and his taijutsu get stronger, but there's only so much that one person can achieve. Until eventually, in the fourth great shinobi world war, not only does Sasuke, but also people like Obito realize that Naruto is stronger than both of them because Naruto is able to bring people to him. And therefore, any weaknesses that Naruto may have are covered by the people that are drawn to him by his magnetic aura. Taking time out of your day to be empathetic, to try and understand other people's situation, while also practicing love for people who are different from you, draws people towards you. And there's no person on earth more powerful than somebody who's able to draw people to them naturally. Not through fear or bribery or violence, simply through their aura, an uncorruptible ray of sunshine that's able to illuminate the path of righteousness for all those around them. And all of that starts with a smile. So while Naruto has taught me many things, more than anything, it's taught me that kindness isn't a weakness. In fact, it's the cure for it. And those who are truly weak are those who tried to be kind, but gave up because the world wasn't kind back to them. Because the only true way to break the cycle of hatred that Naruto talks about so much is practicing kindness in the face of fear and anger. But then again, it also taught me that girls like brooding, angry emo boys, but only the ones you don't want to date. The real women come around for the nice guys. Naruto ends up with Hinata. That's a dub. And Sasuke had to get better as a character before he got Sakura. And considering the fact that Sakura herself doesn't become a good character until Shippuden or the Blank Period or Boruto, that kind of corroborates my point. And yeah, that's it. I actually was gonna do more questions, but we're closing in on a half hour here and this was supposed to be a light video. But as to whether or not we do another one of these is entirely up to you guys. If you liked this Q&A video, then go to the Reddit and ask some questions. And if your questions get upvoted enough, we'll answer them in the next Q&A. Unless of course this video flopped, in which case this will be last one I ever do. If you guys liked it, tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. All right, here's the thing. Listen, all of you short-haired women, you're gorgeous, but like, why did they cut Hinata's hair? Like, why are we making her look like a mom? Ido still looks incredible.